Hi, my name is Jonathan Gray and today I'm going to talk about an agent-based model we built to try and get a bit of insight into the decisions that get made around support for the over 65s in England on both the supply and the demand sides. I'm going to start with a few words on what the motivation for this model actually is and then uh, talk a little bit about going from motivation to model and then sketch the model in its relationship to data and finish up by showing you a few of our results. So here's our motivation. Around about 25% of over 65s in England uh, need help washing or dressing. But only about half of that 25% actually get help to do those things. These figures come from a great bit of work done by some of our Southampton colleagues and they're taken from the 2008 English Longitudinal Survey of Ageing, although they're actually, those figures are actually pretty consistent between different waves of the survey. Um, I think it's also worth noting that if you compare this to opinion surveys, uh, which ask people about their expectations of getting help when they're old, um, people are really over-optimistic. Um, around 75% of people in the Eurobarometer were confident that they would have all of the help that they needed when they got old, and uh, the ONS OPN had that at around 60%. And this leads us to our overarching question. What is up with that? Why are only half of these people getting help? What kind of process might lead to that outcome? And what kind of decisions are going on and how are they being made? Now, to me, because we're asking questions about process and decisions, the obvious thing to do is take an agent-based model approach to this and build a simulation to explore it. Now my take on simulations is that they're really runnable conjectures about a data generating process. Here's a way the world might work to produce this data that we've observed. And here is my guess about what might explain only half of these over 65s who need help actually getting it. Not everybody asks for help. Not everybody asks for help because asking for help is actually pretty risky. Um, they're risking not getting the help that they need, even if they do ask. Uh, they're risking being made to feel like a burden, a loss of social identity, all sorts of things. Asking for help is risky, or at least it feels risky to the people doing the asking. So not everybody asks. And there's a necessary second part to this conjecture. People's decisions are based on risk. People make decisions based on risk, based on the, their beliefs about the rewards or costs that they're going to have to pay. From an agent-based modelling perspective, I think this is really quite important because what it means is we don't need to use a handcrafted algorithm for every situation. We can instead use something much more general that operates on risk. And we can, we can test out this conjecture that I've just given you. And we can test it by building a simulation to embody it and then running the simulation. And if we can't reproduce the data, we can falsify the model and our conjecture about the data generating process is flawed in some way. So to test it, we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a, a slightly more formal representation of our conjecture, um, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, but we also need a few other things. We need a, a synthetic population. And because this conjecture is all about decision making and perceptions of risk, we also need synthetic psychologies for that synthetic population. Oh, and we need something to test it against, obviously. And we're going to take a really simple approach to the synthetic population and just use the English Longitudinal Survey of Aging number that I started off with. And uh, we'll just say that when we generate an agent, uh, there's a 25% chance that they need help washing or dressing. And we'll take a similar approach to our test criteria and say that we're looking for the we're looking for around half of those people who need help actually getting help. So here's our formal process. We've borrowed from game theory, which is all about creating full representations of interactions. And in game theory we define our interactions in terms of players and moves and payoffs. This is a game for three players. One of them is the person who might need help, and the other is somebody deciding whether or not to help that person. The person who might need help can ask for it, or they can do nothing. 
and the decider can give help or they can do nothing. And there are going to be four kinds of payoff in this game. Two of them are shared by both players and two of them are. Payoffs for good and bad outcomes are going to be shared. And what we'll say is that a bad outcome is somebody who needs help not getting help and that anything else that happens is a good outcome. We'll also say that people doing the asking might have to pay a, a penalty, a cost, for asking for help to represent this kind of, uh, this, the, the risky aspect of that. And people making the decisions will have to pay a little cost when, when they actually give help because, asking for, because giving help is expensive in time and it's expensive in money. And I said this was a game for three players, um, and that is actually kind of true. The third player is like the pack of cards in a game of Murder in the Dark. And what's going to happen is the asker and the decider are both going to pick a card and not show it to the other players. And if the asker picks a spade, say, then they need help to get dressed. And if the decider picks a heart, then they're the kind of person who's going to make you feel really crappy about asking for help. If you have a game, you might as well play it, right? And our players are going to be populations of agents. And because we're interested in decision making, um, we're going to have them use really simple decision rules. Decision rules act on payoffs and beliefs. They act on risk. In our model, there are really only two things that you can have beliefs about, and that's what kind of player is the other guy? Are they the killer in our game of murder in the dark? And what happens next? And what we're going to do is we'll give each agent a starter pack of beliefs and then they can update them as they play. And we'll say that this combination, beliefs and a decision rule, is the psychology of our agent. And we've used opinion surveys, the European Social Survey and Eurobarometer, to generate synthetic psychologies for our populations. So I'm just going to talk about that in a little bit more detail now. People doing the asking, they worry about two things really. They worry about what kind of person the other player is. Are they the kind of person who's going to make me feel crappy if I ask for help? And to get a belief type representation of that, what we've done is we've used latent trait analysis on questions about perception of the elderly in the 2008 European Social Survey. These are questions about how most people in your country perceive the elderly. And then we've uh, fitted a distribution to the results of our latent trait analysis. And in fact, I should point out that in these simulations, at least, they don't really need to worry about that at all. Um, I have stacked the deck very carefully, and there are no hearts. All of the people making the decisions are entirely nice. The other thing they have beliefs about is whether they'll actually get help, um, even if they do ask for it. And happily for us, uh, there was a 2007 Eurobarometer which asked pretty much exactly that question. So what we've done is we've taken the responses to that and just fitted a simple multinomial distribution to it. People uh, doing the decision making are a little bit less complicated in this respect. Um, they're really only worried about whether to believe what the other guy says. If they say that they don't need help, should you actually believe that? Should you trust them when they say that? And to capture this, we've again used latent trait analysis on questions from the European Social Survey in 2008 and fitted a distribution to the underlying trait. This time they're questions on social trust. And, okay, I've talked about beliefs, but what I haven't really mentioned is the other part of these psychologies. I won't go into very much detail on the decision rules, but really quickly, we used four. I'll go into slightly more detail than that. All of the rules that we used are learning and deciding rules. And aside from one, the lexicographic rule, the learning here is all Bayesian updating. Agents learn from their own direct experience of playing the game, and they can also learn socially. Um, social learning works really simply in our model. Um, you hear about another player's experiences with some probability, and then that becomes a weighted update to your own beliefs. We're using these four rules in particular because they cover the three main approaches to decision theory. Fast and frugal heuristics or ecological rationality, that's our lexicographic rule. 
Uh, normative, that's how you should be making decisions, um, which is our two Bayesian rules. And descriptive, because you're probably not making decisions in the way that the normative rule says you should be. And that's our cumulative prospect rule. We're also going to draw another distinction here and say that uh, there are two classes of rule here. There are model-free and model-based rules. Two of the rules, uh, the lexicographic and one of our Bayesian rules, think of the world only in terms of a direct link from action to consequence. And the other two, the Bayesian and cumulative prospect rules, uh, they make use of a mental model of the game that they're playing. They have an internal representation of the tree structure that we saw a few slides ago. And all of this together is our model. We've rooted the beliefs of the agents in real data and we'll also take the cost of giving help from real data. And in this case, we're going to use the, the average cost of providing a year of care for somebody in 2008. And we'll take that from the Health and Social Care Information Commission's Personal Social Services Expenditure Data for uh, English local authorities and just take the average of that. This still leaves us quite a few free parameters. Um, and to deal with that, what we do is we build the simulator and run it a bunch of times across the parameter space. And then we take the average proportion of those with and without need who actually get helped to build a statistical emulator. Once we have a statistical emulator, we can use it to look at how sensitive our model is to the free parameters, and then we can also exploit it to find values that will get close to our real data, to the 47.5% of people who need help actually getting it. So around 40,000 simulations later, we can build our statistical emulator, and the first thing we do is we look at how sensitive to the free parameters our model is. What this plot is showing is the effect of the parameters on the proportion of both types of players getting help. And from left to right, we're looking at the payoffs for good and bad outcomes, social cost, the probability of the deciders sharing information and what weight they put on it, the same for the potentially in need, and how entrenched the prior beliefs of deciders and askers are. And from top to bottom, we're looking at our normative, descriptive, lexicographic, and uh, Bayesian heuristic type rules. The most obvious thing first, the, the most significant parameters here are the, the good and the bad payoffs. But it's also pretty easy to see that there are two, two models that don't really work at all. The bottom two rows are simple action consequence models. They don't really show any capability to distinguish between those who are and are not in need. Our more complex models are slightly more interesting. The normative model up at the top suggests that the effect of the payoffs is to differentiate between people who do and don't need help. But the descriptive model, which is the row just below, suggests that actually that's not true at all and that uh, payoffs don't differentiate very well. As I mentioned before, we can also use our statistical emulators to fit the models to real data. But what we can't do, at least in the parameter space that we've looked in, which is pretty extensive, is fit the rules that don't have a model of the world. Wherever you go in parameter space, you end up giving help to those who do and don't need it pretty much equally. It's also important to emphasize, I think, that um, where you can fit param parameters to the models, uh, there's actually a lot of possible fits. And so this, the two that you're seeing here are just two that I've pulled out, which get pretty close to the 47.5% from the real data and only have a handful of people being really confused about why somebody keeps showing up to help put their socks on. So I'm not really going to dwell on those because having fitted some parameters, naturally what we want to do is to change them. And the next few plots are generated using the emulators that we built original, originally. And here, what we're looking at is a prediction of how the model outputs vary as we move away from a fitted parameter while holding the other steady. And we're looking at it for the normative rule here, for the Bayesian rule. I've also added a new measure here, uh, mutual information, which is the solid line on these plots. Mutual information gives an indication of the quality of communication. Um, how informative is it when somebody says that they need help? And obviously in this scenario, higher is better. Higher numbers mean that communication is more informative. 
There's quite a lot of information on this plot, so I'm going to add a little bit of colour, which is hopefully going to make it a little bit easier to interpret. So what I've done is I've arbitrarily divided these up into three kinds of outcomes. Where you see green, there's a, there's a working system, the right people are getting help, and information is flowing. Where you see red, something's gone wrong, and more or less nobody is getting any help. And where we see blue, information flow is on the verge of collapse, or has already collapsed. And right away, we can see that as we'd expect from the sensitivity analysis, changing the payoffs makes a really big difference. And on the face of it, if we were thinking about this from a policy intervention standpoint and we wanted to get more people help, the best thing to do would be to increase the perceived rewards of the good outcome. But here's the same plot for the cumulative prospect theory rule, for the descriptive rule. And the parameters we fitted are different and we get some really contrasting predictions. The intervention which looks like a great idea with a normative model increasing the uh, perceived value of the good outcomes uh, looks much less attractive here. It looks like we'd end up just assigning help to everybody. On the other hand, making the bad outcome look worse seems more appealing here. Um, in the normative model it looked like information flow would collapse if you did that, but here that doesn't look like it's nearly so much of a problem. I think rather than looking at it from that perspective, what we should actually be doing is looking at the commonalities between these two models. And to me, the most obvious place where you see that is in the social learning. Both models predict improvement, helping more of the right people, if older adults are more likely to share information about their experiences. The other thing that they suggest is that uh, we could target the weight that's given to prior beliefs by the people making the decisions, and that would also lead to better outcomes. I have a few thoughts for you to take away, aside from the ones which are up on this slide. First, the combination of simulation and statistical emulation is very, very powerful, and I strongly recommend that you explore it. And the second is really that we neglect psychology at our peril in agent-based modeling. Psychology really matters to agent-based models. How we do decision-making makes a huge difference to the way that the model actually behaves. And now I just have a few references for you. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can get all of our simulation code on GitHub, and if anybody has any questions or suggestions, I'd really love to hear them. So feel free to drop me an email or send me a tweet. Um, if something occurs to you. Thanks again.